Hello, everybody. If the English language, Russian art and history occupy a special place in your lives, or you just want to get new information about familiar things, this is a video for you to see. I invite you to a virtual excursion around the Tretyakov Gallery. Not only will we see some of the masterpieces of the collection, but we will also revise or learn some things about English grammar and vocabulary. And it will also be like using the Wayback Machine. The pictures will help us travel back to the past and turn over the pages of Russia's tumultuous history from the 10th to the 20th century. We wouldn't be able to admire all these pictures now if it hadn't been for Pavel Tretyakov, a merchant who was sure that what has come to him from society should be returned to it in some form. So in 1892, the city of Moscow got a wonderful collection of pictures representing the history of Russian art. The first picture representing the history of Russia is Grand Prince Sviatoslav kissing his mother and children on his return to Kiev from the Danube. The earliest episode of Russian history depicted in the Tretyakov Gallery dates back to the year 969. We can see Prince Sviatoslav greeting his family on his return home. Sviatoslav was a successful military leader, renowned and fearless warrior. And who was his mother? Olga. Sviatoslav was an only son of Igor and Olga. And who was Sviatoslav's grandfather? Rurik. Sviatoslav was waging his successful campaign in Bulgaria on the river Danube when he learned that Kiev had been attacked by the Pechenegs. So the prince and his troops had to return to the homeland and expel the enemies. Sviatoslav's mother, Olga, is looking at him with love and gratitude. His three sons, Yarapolk, Oleg, and Vladimir, the would-be Vladimir the Red Son, who baptized Rus in 988, are happy to see their father. Which of the three was Vladimir? As Vladimir was the youngest son, with all probability, it is he who is depicted in his mom's arm, Olga's housekeeper, Malusha. It was the first time a Russian prince had been depicted in a painting. A Russian prince? It's really surprising that the Russian prince should be dressed like that. A helmet with feathers, toga, Roman sandals. It was the period of classicism in Russian art, and classical art has ancient Greece and Rome sources. The artist does not strive to show all details accurately, be it the clothes of his characters or the age of Sviatoslav's children. What he strives at is to show Sviatoslav as a winner, a person of high morals and a virtuous family man. For this painting, Akimov was awarded a gold medal and sent to Italy at the state's expense to further perfect his skills. He had a great influence on Russian history painting. For a few years, he was director of the Imperial Academy of Arts, where a very strict hierarchy of genres existed. It was history painting, portrait and genre painting, landscape and still life. History painting was at the very top. In history painting, the artist what has to create the men, morals, and events of the past as vividly as if he himself had been alive at the time. After the battle between Igor Sviatoslavovich and the Palotsians, Vaznetsov, 1880. Another picture which glorifies the feat of the Russian warriors. Visitors to the gallery can see the work of this artist even before they enter the Tretyakov Gallery. The facade of the gallery, which is its famous brand, was decorated by Viktor Vaznetsov, who was Tretyakov's close friend. When you visit the gallery offline, pay attention to the white helmets on the facade decorated in the neo-Russian style. Viktor Vaznetsov founded the Russian style within the European Art Nouveau. Most children get acquainted with the artist at an early age because he illustrated a great many Russian fairy tales. But in this picture, he turns to Russian history. Subject has been borrowed from the poem, The Tale of Igor's Campaign, about the failed raid of Igor Sviatoslavovich against the Palovsians. Uh, Igor was the prince of Novgorod Seversk of the Chernigov Principality of Ancient Rus. The princes were all by themselves, which is why Igor's army was defeated. The tale of Igor's campaign is not only a hymn to Russian warriors, 
It's also an appeal for unity. As it says in Vladimir Nabokov's translation of the poem, the strife of the princes against the enemy has come to an end. For brother says to brother, this is mine and that is mine too. The moral of the poem is no unity, no strength. The battle is over. The field is covered with dead bodies. The dead warriors still hold their shields, which are of no use now. The battle is over for the people, but not for the birds of prey. The sun, which has a reddish hue, the color of the blood spilled, is rising on the horizon. The young Rostislav, with an arrow in his heart, is lying as if he were just asleep. Vaznitsov's brother, Apolinari, served as a model for the young warrior. Next to him is an experienced warrior, Izyaslav. None of the Russian princes had come to his rescue during the battle. The dead warriors are handsome, unlike the Palovtsians, who are depicted like twisted snakes. There are flowers near the Russian princes. The warriors are dead, but nature is full of life, and it is in deep mourning of the warriors. As it says in Vladimir Dombokov's translation of the poem, on the whole, there is something theatrical, definitely unreal about this picture. Nobody had depicted the battle scenes like this before. The audience wondered, and where are the horses of the warriors? And they said, it looks as if the old warrior had first laid his coat on the ground and then lay on it. Vaznetsov was upset. Most of the people at the exhibition turned their backs on my picture. Few people were able to fully appreciate this stage-like composition. Among them was Trechikov, who never relied on the tastes and opinions of the public. Vaznetsov showed the event not so much as a battle scene, but as a poetic tale about the beauty of the feat. Ivan the Terrible, Vaznetsov, 1897. Another historical picture by Vaznetsov is also done in the national Russian tradition. No portraits of the Tsar were painted during his life, but most of us imagine the first Tsar of all Russia like this. Ivan IV was not only an awesome Tsar, but he was also a wise, resolute, and deeply lonely person. On the one hand, we feel respect for the rule's intelligence and strength. On the other, fear of his cruelty. It was after the death of his beloved first wife, Anastasia, that he became especially paranoid and vengeful. In 1564, Ivan started the domestic policy of straight repression and terror. The Aprichniki had unlimited power to terrorize the boyars and the population as a whole. His suspicious gaze and tense figure create the illusion of a dark character, but full of grandeur and strength. Ivan is walking down the stairs. He has stopped, listening to something attentively. There's a double-headed eagle on the carpet. Another step and... We don't know if he will step on it or not. Although you can see only a small part of the staircase, you can immediately imagine the old Russian Terim. Ivan was wearing the brocaded fur coat, a hat trimmed with fur, and if you look attentively, you will see a row of icons decorating it. Ivan was a very religious person. When Vaznetsov was working on this picture, he was inspired by the image of Ivan the Terrible created by the great f singer Fyodor Shalyapin in the opera Pskavityanka by Rimsky-Korsakov. And Shalyapin in his turn wrote that only after he had seen the sketch of the picture was he able to create a powerful and convincing image of the awesome czar on the stage. In spite of the fact that Vaznetsov set an enormously high price for the picture, 15,000 rubles, two people immediately expressed their desire to purchase the picture. They were Pavel Tretikov and the Grand Prince Pavel Alexandrovich. The picture found its way to the Tretikov Art Gallery. Vaznetsov is a bit of a historian he scrupulously studied all historical artifacts. When he was working on this picture, the historical museum had also opened and Vaznetsov frequented it. I don't know when you'll be able to make up your mind to see the picture offline, but when you decide to visit the gallery, make sure you find the cast iron portrait of Ivan the Terrible among the pictures decorating the fountain of the Tretikov Gallery. The Siege of Pskov. Ivan engaged in a great many wars. In the middle of his reign, Ivan the Terrible started the Livonian War, which he needed to gain access to the Baltic Sea. Initially, he conquered a number of important merchant towns, but at the end of his reign, the Polish king 
Stefan Batori regained the territory captured by Ivan the Terrible, invaded the Russian lands, and laid siege to the city of Pskov. This huge picture by Karl Brulov depicts the most crucial moment of one of the attacks on Pskov. On the morning of the 8th of September, 1581, the enemy blew up the city wall and occupied Svinaya and Pakrovskaya towers. The defenders of Pskov, headed by Ivan Shuisky, were exhausted. Even the residents of the city, including women and children, rose to its defense. But not until the monks from the Pskova Pichersky Monastery had come to their rescue and raised the morale of the defenders were the Russian troops able to crush the enemy forces. It was a major victory, a victory difficult to overestimate. If Batori had managed to occupy Pskov, the expansion into the Russian lands would have continued. Only after Stepan Batori's army had been defeated in this battle did the two sides agree to conclude a treaty. By painting this picture, Brulov, who was an outstanding artist of the period of Romanticism in Russian art, wanted to repeat the success of the last days of Pompeii, which made Brulov a household name. But after four years of hard work on this picture, Brulov got disappointed, discouraged by the harsh critique of his painting, and he left it unfinished. But that's what the novelty of the picture consisted in. It was the first time in historical painting that Russian people in battle had been shown not like heroes of antiquity, but as national characters. Brulov's experience was used by the great masters of historical painting, Vasily Surikov and Ivan the Terrible and his son Ivan on November 16, 1581. And here's the famous masterpiece by Ilya Repin, the most famous, so to speak, the most celebrated of all Russian artists. Though he had never been an active member of the Society for Traveling Art Exhibitions, known as the Wanderers, he was very close to them. In his works, Repin treated both contemporary subjects and historical motifs, creating a painted encyclopedia of Russian life. The picture Ivan the Terrible and his son Ivan on the 16th of November, 1581, is a genuine masterpiece, about which Lev Tolstoy said, everything is said so masterfully that you cannot notice mastery. A horrifying scene in the Alexandrovskaya Slabada. The anguished Ivan the Terrible is hugging his dying son. The son's body is slowly sinking down to the floor. The father is trying to stop the flow of blood from his son's temple. Ivan the Terrible, whose face is a mask of horror and despair, realizes what he has done and it's driving him mad. As the writer Sevalad Garshin who sat as a model for Ivan the Terrible's son, said, Ivan has the face of a man who is destined to die, but there is no anger, there is kind forgiveness on his face. Ivan is passing out, his face is getting green. He's making an effort to rise, but he's too weak. The color red prevails in the picture. The blood red carpet and the cushions seem to be soaked with blood. Here the color ceases to be just a color can easily imagine the sequence of events. The chair is overturned. Ivan the Terrible must have risen to his feet in indignation. On the floor, we see the Tsar's staff, whose tip is covered with blood. Ivan threw it into his son and hit him in the temple. Tsarevich fell down, bunching the rug with his feet. A few days later, Tsarevich died from the wound in his head, and Ivan the Terrible left the Alexandrovskaya Slabada for good. There's still a question mark about what made the mentally unstable monarch so furious. Did the father and son quarrel because of the cruel way Ivan the Terrible treated the pregnant wife of his son, Yelena Sheremetyeva? Or was it because of his disagreement with the Livonian War when Ivan the son dared to give advice to his mighty father? Repin's work invariably drew the attention of large audiences. But when the picture was first exhibited, people would go there and stand in line specially to see the picture. But pretty soon, it was removed from the exhibition for three months. It was the first time censorship had been applied in Russian art. Babed Anostsev claimed it was not a historical picture, but a mere fantasy. 
Alexander III didn't like the picture either. He found it offensive to show the first Russian czar as a murderer. Besides, he regarded the picture as a political provocation. Repin painted this picture soon after the assassination of Alexander II by the members of the People's Will organization in 1881 and the execution that followed. Alexander III declared, as a son, I would avenge my father's death. I don't believe in the principle tit for tat, but as czar, I find it my duty to punish the criminals. The date in the picture's title, 1581, might evoke associations with the cruelty of the Russian monarch three centuries later. It is a picture with a tragic fate. In 1913, it was attacked by an old believer, Abram Balashov. He cried, we have had enough blood and stabbed the painting with a knife three times. The damage was serious. There were long cuts on the faces. At that time, the picture hung low. It was a great shock for the personnel of the gallery. The main keeper of the gallery, Georgi Huruslov, wasn't able to cope with the tragedy and committed suicide. Ilya Efimovich tried to restore the picture, but he was so busy perfecting it that the faces became unrecognizable. The director of the gallery, Igor Grabar, had to restore the picture himself. Now, the very fact of Ivan killing his son is questioned. There is no convincing evidence of this. Whether Ivan really killed his son is not clear. If Ivan had killed his son, there would be some evidence of him repenting his crime. He usually repented his sins. In October 2013, a group of Orthodox activists sent an open letter to then Minister of Culture Vladimir Medinsky. They claimed that this picture distorted historical truth. They demanded that the picture be removed from the exhibition to the storeroom. But the answer was, it's a work of art, not an illustration of a historical fact. Two years ago, the picture was attacked and badly damaged again. This time it was done by a vandal from Varonezh for the reason he could hardly explain. Now that the picture is still being restored after this terrible assault, you cannot see it in the gallery. But one of the advantages of video excursions is that you can see pictures which are not on display temporarily. When the picture is returned to public view, Make sure you see this picture again and look the anguished Tsar in the eye. You will see that the picture still has the power to shock. Ivan's death was not only a family tragedy, but it was also a political disaster, the end of the dynasty. Ivan left two sons as heirs. The elder son became the Tsar Fyodor Ioanovich. The second son, Dmitry Vuglich, was only eight when one day he was discovered dead with his throat cut. Whether it was done on the order of Boris Godunov is not known. In any event, he had a motive in getting rid of the heir to the throne. When Fyodor died childless in 1598, the rule of the 700-year-long dynasty was over and the time of troubles began. Fifteen years of unrest, civil wars, and famine killed one-third of the population. Only with the expulsion of the Poles from the country and the election of a Tsar at least distantly related to Ivan the Terrible, the time of troubles was over. A suitable young man was found. The candidate, who the Zimsky Sabor unanimously elected out of 10 candidates, was the young Mikhail Romanov. He was the son of Fyodor Nikitich Romanov. Moments of Russian history. Mikhail Romanov uh, became the founder of the new dynasty that would rule the country through 1917. The young Mikhail is confused. He presses his right hand to his heart, and with his other hand, he seems to dismiss the ambassadors approaching him. Only after they had asked him several times did he agree. Mikhail, his mother, and Archbishop Fyodorit are in the center of the composition, in front of the iconostasis. To the right, in a sable coat, Fyodor Ivanovich Sheremetyev, who brings Mikhail Romanov the regalia of Russian Tsar and the Golden Cross. Their gestures are ceremonial. In contrast to the simple citizens depicted on the left of the picture, who are rushing enthusiastically toward the newly confirmed Tsar. Alexei Mikhailovich choosing a bride, Grigory Sedov, 1882. The son of the first Romanov, uh, Alexei, is shown as a youth. He is 18. 
Two years after he ascended the throne, he is choosing a bride. The tradition of organizing bride shows for great princes and czars was borrowed from Byzantium. Sophia Paleolog was the first to use this method, selecting a bride for her son Vasily. Traditionally, there were three tours. First, the czar's envoys canvassed for beautiful maidens throughout the country. Then the boyars selected the best girls, and in the end, the czar himself chose a bride of his liking out of the several most beautiful girls. For Alexei, they selected 200 girls, and now he is to choose one out of the six. The girl Alexei liked was Yefimia Sevalskaya. We can see her in profile dressed in a gown of blue velvet. She is a bit taller than the other girls. However, shortly after having been uh, selected, uh, Euphemia fainted. It might have been because they had tightened her hair too much. Euphemia was diagnosed as an epileptic. She and her family were accused of concealing her illness from the Tsar and exiled to Siberia. Only after Alexei had married Maria Miloslovska were the Sevolskia forgiven. One of the important events during the reign of Alexei, who went down in history as the quietest, was the schism, or church division, which followed the church reform of Patriarch Nikon in 1653 and created a popular movement of old believers in protest. Boyarnia Marozova, Vasily Surikov, 1887. One of the best known partisans of the old believers movement was Fyodosia Marozova. By the time Surikov's masterpiece was exhibited, Surikov had already gained tremendous popularity as an artist. Vasily Surikov was deeply interested in the turning points of Russia's tumultuous history. He depicted strong-willed, intransigent people who never gave up, never betrayed their ideas. Bayarnia Marozova is the work of the artist Prime. The scene depicted brings us back to the events of the 17th century. As a result of Patriarch Nikon's reforms, the Russian Orthodox got split, and the supporters of the traditional Russian church were persecuted. Many of them were burned alive, like the spiritual leader of the old believers, Archpriest Avakum. The woman in black in the center of the picture is Marozova, a woman of noble birth. Fyodosia Marozova vehemently supported Avakum and opposed Nikon's reforms. In the picture, she is being taken to a convent where she'll be starved to death in an earthen prison in Barovsk. She knows that she is condemned to a terrible death and she will be tortured, but she's still intransigent. Her dark eyes sparkle in her face uh, with fanaticism. Her raised hand is blessing the crowd in the two-fingered manner of the old believers. The sledge is cutting the crowd in half as Nikon's reforms cut Russian society in half. To the left of the sledge, there's a group of people who are laughing and mocking at Marozova. To the right of the sledge are two people who support Marozova. None of those people who looked her in the eye dares to laugh. Those people feel sorry for her, but cannot do it openly. Only the fool dares to repeat Marozova's gesture. The feeble-minded fool won't be persecuted. In the image of the wanderer with a stick, Surikov depicted himself. This picture produces a very strong emotional effect. You'll feel the tension and tragedy of the monument. The palette is very rich and colorful. The canvas looks like a multicolored carpet. I'd like to draw your attention to the way the snow is painted. There are dozens of different hues, but there's no clear white. At first, Surikov had a difficulty showing the movement. Only after Surikov had painted a running boy did the sledge start moving. A very interesting fact. For years, it was believed that Surikov had sewn a piece of canvas to the picture in order to enlarge the snow-covered space with the track from the sledge on it. And it lent movement to the sledge. This is what Maximilian Valoshin wrote in his book about Surikov. But later, uh, according to the latest information some time ago, they examined the back of the huge canvas. There is no seam. The composition is perfectly balanced, Surikov wrote. That composition is mathematics of painting, and Surikov was second to none in this. The picture is really the gem of the Tretikov Art Gallery. One of the critics wrote, maybe we wouldn't have uh, Bayarinya Marozova if Perov hadn't 
The Dispute on Faith. We know Vasily Perov is an artist of people's sorrow who depicted a harsh reality of everyday life, and we associate his name with the style of critical realism. But in this large-scale work, Perov turns to history. The history also deals with the burning issue of old believers, but 10 years later. The death of Fyodor Alexeyevich and the proclamation of Peter as Tsar was followed by the Strelsi uprising in May 1682, which resulted in the joint rule of Peter I and Ivan V, with Sofia as their regent. In her struggle for power, Sofia was supported by Vasily Galitsyn and Ivan Havansky. Havansky forced Patriarch Joachim to agree to a public debate with one of the Old Believers leaders, Nikita Pustasvat. Old Believers, feeling the weakness of power, became more active and demanded that the issues connected with Patriarch Nikon's reform should be discussed with the ruler of the country. Nikita insisted that the dispute be held on Red Square so that a lot of people could participate. Sophia gave her royal assent to the dispute, but in the Kremlin. July 1682, the faceted chamber, whose interiors look uh, pretty much the same today. In the left part of the picture is Sophia, her relatives and supporters. On the right-hand side, Nikita Dabrinin, a priest from Suzdal, dubbed Pustas Sviat. He is accompanied by other old believers. They came to the faceted chamber with icons, crosses and burning candles to hand over a petition. Nikita Dabrinin was not only the leading spokesman of old believers, but he also supported by the Streltsy. We can see one of them with his back to us. How did the Streltsy dare to come to the Kremlin with their demands? They thought Sophia owed them a lot. It was with their support that she became the de facto ruler of the country. She wouldn't be standing here as regent if the Streltsy hadn't helped her in her struggle with the Narishkins in May of the same year. Next to Safia is Patriarch Joachim, Prince Vasily Galitsyn, and Vasily Havansky. Near the throne are Safia's aunt Tatyana Mikhailovna and sister Maria Alexeyevna and Natalia Kirillovna. On the floor is Archbishop Athanasius of Kalamagori. What happened here? Why is the Archbishop holding his hand against his cheek? The first question Nikita asked Patriarch Joachim was about church dogmas. Why do you, during church services, hold the cross in your left hand and triple candlestick in your right hand? Is fire superior to the cross? The Patriarch answering the question didn't sound convincing enough, and the Archbishop from Kalamagari Athanasius interfered in the talk, which made Nikita furious, and he struck the archbishop on the cheek with the cross. Safia rose in indignation and exclaimed, Look what Nikita is doing. He's beating the archbishop in our presence. If we were not here, he would have killed him. And then addressing Nikita, our discussion is over. I'd rather you left. After the dispute, Nikita looked arrogant and pleased as if he had got the upper hand. But no sooner had he left the Kremlin than he was arrested to be executed the next day. Only in 1905, when the decree on religious tolerance was signed, did they stop persecuting old believers. Of the Streltsy execution by Surikov. On a cold autumn morning, Red Square is crowded with people. That's what the last revolt of the Streltsy ended in. Massive tortures and executions all over Moscow in Priobrazhenskaya, along the city walls near the Novodevichy convent. But Surikov depicts the tragic moments before the execution on Red Square in the very heart of Russia. The artist deemed it important that extra significance be given to the tragic event. The change of historical epochs should take place in the very center of the state. Two irreconcilable forces, the Streltsy to be executed, personifying the outgoing Russia, and Peter asserting the emerging European, Europeanized Russia. The Tsar watches the preparations on horseback. This is a picture of a national tragedy screaming silently. There is no blood, no death shown. There's something more horrible than death. It's awaiting death. We seem to hear the minutes tick for each of the condemned. There are rows of gallows near the Kremlin wall. In the crowd, we can see Streltsy wearing the white shirts of the condemned 
with funeral candles in their hands for the purification of the soul. The tragedy of the event depicted seems to unfold gradually from left to right. On the left-hand side, a Strelitz with his head bowed in despair above a steadily burning candle. He is all alone. His time is still to come. He is the last in the queue of death. To his right is a red-bearded man staring at the Tsar with hatred. He is the only person who hasn't taken off his cap in front of the Tsar. His spirit is not broken by the fear of death. There's a duel of views between the Strelets and Peter, and it represents a tragic collision between the old and the new. The two irreconcilable forces will never come to terms. On the far right is Estrelets, who is being taken to the gallows. His candle went out. It is cast down on the ground in the mud, a tragic symbol of the fading life. Behind the Streltsy and their families in St. Basil's Cathedral, whose domes have been cut off. The spiritual symbol of old Russia looks beheaded. Old Russia is gone. New order is setting in. Surikov intentionally brings St. Basil's Cathedral closer to the Kremlin walls, making the space of Red Square condensed and oppressive. Though he painted only a few dozen characters, he achieved the effect of a dense crowd. On the right-hand side, lined up by the Kremlin wall, are a Priyabrzhinsky guard, guardsmen, soldiers of the Reformed Army. Bowing to Peter in the uniform of the Priyabrzhinsky bombardier is Alexander Menshikov. He is asking for permission to start the execution. There's also a retinue of boyars and invited diplomats. Among them is the Austrian Secretary of Legation, uh, Johann Korb, who described the suppression of the Streltsy revolt in minute detail in his diary. In the carriage, we can see a young woman. It's highly likely that is Sophia's sister, Marfa, who, as Peter suspected, acted as an intermediary between the Streltsy and Sophia. She brought her pies with notes inside the Novodevichy convent. Witnessing the execution might teach Marfa a lesson. Peter himself looks like an animal, like a centaur. There's a frozen hatred in his eyes. It's the morning of his revenge. He remembers the terrible moments of his childhood when after the death of the Tsar Fyodor Alexeyevich in 1682, the Streltsy, incited by the Miloslavsky family, brutally murdered people close to him. He also remembers how in 1689, he had to flee from Priyabrzhinska to the Trinity Monastery. Sophia's plan failed and Peter sent his half-sister down to the convent. And this time, taking advantage of Peter's long absence in the country, the Streltsy made another attempt to solve their problems and to help Sophia ascend the throne. The revolt of 1698 was suppressed ruthlessly. Over 2,000 people were executed. Peter was cruel to excess and people would say, if our Tsar doesn't drink human blood in the morning, he won't feel like eating bread. Now that we have recreated in our memory the events of the Streltsy mutinies, you can easily say what is wrong with the title of the picture of another great artist, Ilya Repin. This is Sofia Alexeyevna, a year after her incarceration in the Novodevichy convent, by Repin. So it's not one, but nine years after Sophia was incarcerated in the convent in 1689. After the revolt of 1689, her life in the convent became a continuous torture. She was forced to take the veil under the name of Susanna, and a week later, 30 gallows were constructed near the walls of the Novodevichy convent, and 230 Streltsy were hanged. Three of them, who had urged her to regain the throne, were hanged in front of her window, with a petition to Sophia to become their sovereign tied to their hands of one of them. She was kept in the strictest seclusion. The other nuns were not allowed to see her except on Easter Day. Painting for Ryepin, especially the portrait genre, was a sort of laboratory where he observed human types. Sophia was a woman of strong character, resolute, intelligent, power striving. In the picture, she is furious and indignant. She is like a trapped animal. Kramskoy compared her to a tigress locked in a cage. Repin reproduces the past in minute detail. He even had Sophia's dress sewn. 
He even found out what color Sofia's eyes were. Interestingly enough, it was Valentin Serov's mother who posed for this portrait. Highly educated, her teacher uh, was Simeon uh, Palotsky. Uh, Well-read, smart, and strong-willed, she might have made a good ruler. If Peter hadn't ascended to the throne, Sophia would have become a sovereign on a par with Catherine the Great or Elizabeth. Peter the Great interrogating Tsarevich Alexei Petrovich at Peterhof, Nikolai Gia. Peter radically reformed all walks of social and economic life. If it hadn't been for Peter the Great's reforms, the medieval period in Russia might have lasted even longer. Peter dragged the country kicking and screaming out of the Middle Ages. Reforming the country was more important for Peter than any personal relationship. The picture, Peter the Great interrogating Tsarevich Alexei Petrovich at Peterhof, reflects not only the drama of the father and son, but also the opposition of two irreconcilable forces. If Alexei had come to power, all Peter the Great's reforms would have been brought to an end. Nikolai Ge finished his picture just in time for the celebration of the bicentenary of the birth of Peter the Great. It made a row at the first exhibition of the wanderers. Kramskoy wrote, it's Ge who definitely reigns the exhibition. Just a momentary look at the picture and we can see a whole historical epoch. We know the backstory. Peter suspected his son of collusion with his political enemies and conspiracy. Alexei fled abroad and in order to get him back, they promised that if he returned to Russia, they would forgive him, return him all of his property and let him live in the countryside. Later, as we know, Peter went back on his word under the pretext that there was new evidence of his son's guilt. The scene is set in the Mont Place Palace. The Almighty Father and the weak son totally alienated from him. Peter is looking at his son with contempt and aversion. His figure is turned away from him. On the table, there are papers with the evidence of the Tsarevich's involvement in the conspiracy. One of the papers is on the floor. The corner of the table separates the father and the son. The red and black color of the tablecloth, the color of mourning, foreshadows a, tra a tragedy. The checked floor reminds of a chess game, and it's clear who's going to win and who's just a pawn in this game. Alexei died in prison after tortures in 1718. Peter the Great didn't want to leave the throne to his grandson, Peter Alexeyevich, and in 1722, he signed a decree on succession to the throne so that every succeeding ruler individually had to name their heir. Peter himself died before doing so. What followed was a disorder and a power struggle between the old boyar and families uh, and the new nobility. If it hadn't been for that law, the epoch of palace revolutions wouldn't have started with the death of Peter the Great in 1725. Over the next 40 years, Russia was mostly ruled by women and power was often seized by force with the support of the imperial guards. Without their backing, rulers had little chance of staying on the throne. In 1725, Catherine, the first seized power and ruled for two years, delegating all duties of governing to Alexander Menshikov. She was followed on the throne by Peter's grandson, Peter II. His three years of rule were best characterized by his carefree lifestyle and the influence of old boyar families. Peter II died of smallpox on the morning of his wedding. It was he who prosecuted his grandfather's right-hand man, Alexander Menshikov deprived him of all his possessions, and sent him down to Siberia.